All right, so good morning, everyone. Welcome to our very last uh, Hematology, Oncology, and Robert H. Lurie Can Comprehensive Cancer Center Grand Rounds. We're delighted to have one of our very own faculty and colleagues, Dr. Jonathan Strauss. Uh, Dr. Strauss is Associate Professor and Vice Chair for Education in the Department of Radiation Oncology and a specialist in gynecologic and breast oncology. Um, he received his undergraduate degree, graduating magna cum laude at Brown University, followed by an MD and MBA at the University of Chicago, and then completed his residency and chief residency um, at Rush University. And we've been fortunate to have him here at Northwestern ever since. Um, so please welcome Dr. Strauss. Well, uh, Jonathan, thanks so much for that kind introduction and thank you to the team for the invitation. I'm really glad to, to get a chance to, to chat with everybody about uh, radiotherapy and node positive breast cancer. And, and this topic is so big that this is more of a kind of 30,000 foot overview a little bit. And we won't cover much of post mastectomy radiotherapy just kind of for time. But at least I'll give everybody here, most of you probably not radiation oncologists, a sense for um, the issues that we're, we're thinking about now um, in, in breast radiotherapy. And I wanna start um, just by mentioning that, you know, um, breast radiotherapy is pretty valuable and we've known that for a while and especially true in women with node positive breast cancer. So if we look at a meta-analysis that looks at just radiotherapy to the breast without including regional nodal irradiation, that for, excuse me, for women with node positive breast cancer, what we see is that radiotherapy reduces any recurrence by about a third and improves uh, breast cancer mortality by about 9% or so, which in, in absolute terms, which is honestly quite a, quite a nice benefit. And um, the question that we had been struggling with for quite a while is, okay, we're convinced that we should irradiate the breast, should we also treat the regional lymph nodes while we're treating the breast? And here we have a few relatively recent trials that have shed some light, but by no means kind of uh, resolved all of our conflicts on this question. And I'm gonna present a key trial that we're gonna reference back to a few times in other analyses. So this is the Canadian MA20 trial. It's a pretty straightforward design. It took 1,800 women, the vast majority of whom had one to three positive lymph nodes. Everybody underwent a lumpectomy and an axillary dissection. Everybody got systemic therapy. Everybody got radiotherapy that encompassed, oops, let's see if you can see my cursor, that encompassed the breast. And the randomization was plus or minus regional nodal irradiation. When we used it, it was to all the basins. It was essentially to the undissected, usually actually apex and supraclavicular fossa in the internal mammary chain and would occasionally encompass the dissected eczema. And so what did we find? Well, the first thing, not surprisingly, is that when we added radiotherapy to these basins, we could increase toxicity. We saw that pneumonitis went up from about 0.2% to 1.2%. So we had a little more radiation pneumonitis owing to the fact that a greater volume of lung was encompassed, especially in that apex. And our rate of lymphedema doubled. These numbers look kind of low. And I think just the bar for definition of lymphedema in this trial was a little bit high, but we doubled the risk of, of upper extremity lymphedema. On the other hand, it came with benefits, despite the fact that this was a pretty low risk group, most of them had one to three positive nodes and much of the rest were node negative. What we saw was um, a benefit with regard to disease-free survival that was 5% or so um, with a hazard ratio of 0.76, um, improved distant disease-free survival, reduced the risk of an isolated local regional recurrence by about 3%. The overall survival um, benefit numerically did not achieve statistical significance. So we appeared to reduce the risk of distant disease and all recurrence, but we didn't quite, at least at first publication, uh, achieve an overall survival advantage. Still, that looks pretty good. The trouble we run into is when we look at this forest plot and we ask, well, what subset of patients was really deriving this benefit? Do we have to treat 
everybody with positive nodes or can we identify some subset that really drives the benefit? And the challenge was we really couldn't. All of these are to the left of the line. So it wasn't clear that there was one subset that derived most of the benefit. Now, I will say on this analysis, it did look like it was women with ER negative disease that derive most of the benefit as compared to ER positive. And then we'll see this finding is not replicated in other trials. So essentially the answer was we were having trouble finding the right subset and instead regional nodal irradiation yielded a small benefit to every subset. There was a sister trial to this done by the Europeans, EORTC 22922, it was twice as large, it enrolled 4,000 women. It was a somewhat more complex uh, criteria. It had almost half of women had node negative, but medial tumors and a little, about 55% had node positive disease. They could all undergo either lumpectomy or mastectomy. But similarly to the MA20 trial, they all got an axillary dissection and they were randomized plus or minus regional nodal irradiation to the supraclavicular fossa, undissected axillary apex and internal mammary chain. Both are neither. Again, in this trial, well, in this trial, we saw much less of a risk of an additional risk to lymphedema, but we saw the very same benefits. We saw that we breast cancer mortality was improved by close to 4%, and there was a numerical overall survival advantage that did not achieve statistical significance. And similarly, when we look at a forest plot by subset, what we see is that all of these boxes look to be a little bit to the left of the line. So every group seems to derive a modest benefit from regional nodal irradiation, and we can't seem to define subsets who derive more benefit or who don't benefit. Although this trial did not provide us with a subset by estrogen receptor status, it did tell us about receipt of hormone therapy. We'll assume that's a good surrogate. The people who got hormone therapy were people who were ER positive. And in this trial, it looked like the, the a subset of women who received hormone therapy, so those who were ER positive, may have derived a slightly larger benefit, which is to say it looks exactly the opposite of what we saw in MA20. We don't see a consistent subset that appears to benefit more. So if we're treating the regional lymph node basins, do we need to treat the internal mammary chain? Or is most of our benefit coming from supraclavicular irradiation? Well, this is still a bit controversial. We have a few trials that have asked this question and none of them answered it definitively. Here's a French trial in which relatively low risk women were accrued. They were either node positive or had a medial or central tumor, but were node negative. Everybody underwent a mastectomy and everybody got radiotherapy that encompassed the chest wall and the axilla and supraclavicular fossa. And they were randomized plus or minus internal mammary node irradiation. And this trial was powered to find a 10% overall survival advantage, which is most of us would say unrealistically high. This little postage stamp of a radiation field is not gonna increase overall survival by 10%, which is to say it's underpowered to find a realistic benefit for internal memory or radiation. What did we see? A 3% overall survival advantage numerically that did not achieve statistical significance and subsetted and and some said it looked like it accrued mostly to women with axillary node positive disease and medial tumors where it really looks more impressive than for women with node negative disease. We have a second trial, a Korean trial, that was similarly underpowered, also powered for a 10% survival advantage for internal mammary node irradiation, also found numerically about a three and a half percent survival advantage that did not achieve statistical significance. So are these trials both negative trials or are they both underpowered trials? I, you know, it, it, it's difficult to say. It's clear that internal memory nodal irradiation doesn't yield a 10% survival advantage. What is not clear is whether it might yield a very small, a small benefit. And here we look at a very interesting Danish study. It had um, a bigger sample size, 
it was what, what we might call natural randomization, which is to say that they set a national policy that women with one or more axillary lymph nodes who were treated with radiotherapy and who were getting radiotherapy to the breast or chest wall and to the regional nodes would get IM nodal radiation if they had right-sided breast cancer and would not get it if they had left-sided breast cancer. And this was because concerns about heart dose for encompassing the internal mammary chain on the left side. And what did we see? There was an overall survival advantage of about 3%, which is about what we saw numerically in our other trials for left-sided breast cancer as compared, excuse me, for right-sided breast cancer as compared to left, which means either, I would say, either the radiotherapy they were getting to that internal mammary chain was helpful or breast cancers behave better if they know they're in the right breast. And that, that seems unlikely. And there's essentially not a selection bias in this since although it was not randomized, it was very clear that all women with right-sided breast cancer were receiving IM nodal irradiation. So I think this series suggests to many of us that there probably is uh, that the benefit that we see from regional nodal irradiation derives at least in part from encompassing this internal mammary chain. And I will say in conjunction to that, and we'll get to this later, that we're now very good at heart sparing, even while encompassing the internal mammary chain. And so as a result, most of us are including the internal mammary lymph nodes when we're doing regional nodal irradiation. And, uh, and here I just show graphically, again, this overall survival advantage that appears to be associated with inclusion of the internal mammary chain. So there are now a whole series of trials being done in countries around the world, although mostly in our, with our European friends that are asking more questions about regional nodal irradiation. And especially, does it substitute for axillary dissection like we saw in, the, in a, some trials I won't present? Do we need to do any sort of nodal uh, treatment in women with low risk? nodal disease or can we leave out axillary dissection and regional nodal irradiation? And there are a whole series of these trials that are ongoing and that hopefully in the years to come will help to clarify some of our current conundrums. And so, as I mentioned earlier, regional nodal irradiation yields a clear but pretty modest benefit. And the trials that we've done so far do not help us to discern which subset of women derive most of the benefit and which do not. And instead we're using what I call the Oprah strategy, which is essentially you get regional nodal radiation and you get regional nodal radiation, but we don't know for whom we can safely omit it. And there are a series of strategies that we're exploring to try to help us answer this question. And I'll review each of these strategies in turn. The first is the simplest, which is simply counting the number of positive nodes just using end stage. And here were some data that were presented a couple of years ago at San Antonio, although I haven't seen published yet, that's just looking at a meta-analysis of a whole series of regional nodal irradiation trials and showing that although the benefit appears pretty much negligible for women with N0 disease, it appears small for women with N1 disease and quite impressive for women with N2 disease. And as you would expect from a meta-analysis, when you dig deeply, this, this meta-analysis does include oh, really significantly heterogeneous trials. And in fact, the women with N2 disease are mostly in different trials than the women with N1 disease with different sorts of randomizations. And I don't think we should be super confident in these data, but it does suggest that although the benefit by hazard ratio may be similar across these groups. The absolute benefit appears to be much larger for women with N2 disease, which is to say four or more positive nodes. That said, there does still appear to be some benefit for women with N1 disease. But let's get to some of the more interesting, I think, um, uh, techniques for trying to discern who derives more benefit. So this is an exploratory analysis that came out of the MA20 trial that I think is very interesting. Having done this randomization, plus or minus regional nodal irradiation, 
the MA20 group went back and divided women into three groups. Those with luminal A-like tumors, which they defined as being both ER and PR positive, HER2 negative, and grade one or two. And in this group, there appeared to be no benefit for regional nodal irradiation. By contrast, those women with luminal B-like tumors, which is those that were ER or PR positive, HER2 new positive or grade three, so somewhat more aggressive looking ER positive tumors or hormone receptor positive tumors, there appeared to be a more sizable benefit for regional nodal irradiation with a hazard ratio of 0.66. And similarly, all of the ER negative tumors, whether triple negative or HER2 positive, also seem to derive a benefit for regional nodal irradiation. Although it's fair to say that for those who were HER2 positive, this was, you know, this really preceded the anti-HER2 therapy era. And so uh, do we have any confirmation of this? Well, there's some other interesting data that looked at other ways to kind of identify a low risk luminal A-like group. And in this case, their data um, using, using the 21 gene recurrence score, or what we might call oncotype. And so if we look at NSABP B28, this was a randomized trial um, looking at the addition of a taxane in node positive breast cancer. But we can look back at women um, who got radiotherapy, which is to say everyone got radiotherapy to the breast alone after breast conservation to get regional radiation. Nobody got any radiotherapy after mastectomy. And then for the subset of women for whom tumor specimens were available, the 21 gene recurrence score was run and we looked at local regional recurrence as first event. And what we see is that those women who had a high oncotype or 21 gene recurrence score and a much higher risk of local regional recurrence as compared to those women who had intermediate or low scores. And those women with a low score seem to have a very low risk of local regional recurrence in the absence of regional nodal irradiation. And in fact, on multivariable analysis, in addition to T stage and N stage being prognostic for a local regional recurrence, so too was this 21 gene recurrence score. And this is suggesting that perhaps in addition to, to helping to drive systemic therapy decisions, this recurrence score may be valuable in driving radiotherapy decisions. And we have some very new data put together by Wendy Woodward out of the MD Anderson that found a similar thing. This look back at a SWOG trial looking at systemic therapy in women with node positive breast cancer. And again, ran a 21 gene recurrence score where available. And what we see is that for those patients with one to three positive nodes, the risk of local regional recurrence varied by recurrence score, that those who were intermediate or high had a much higher risk of local regional recurrence as compared to those with a low risk recurrence score. By contrast, for women with N2 disease, the risk of local regional recurrence was relatively high regardless of recurrence score. So it does suggest to us that perhaps recurrence score may be valuable in prognosticating the risk of local regional recurrence for women with a relatively lower nodal burden. And this is something that we're now assessing in a large prospective randomized trial. This is a Canadian trial, but I will say we have it open at Northwestern and we are actively accruing to this trial where we can. And so what it's looking at is women with low volume nodal disease with a low um, 21 gene recurrence score and randomizing them. If they got a lumpectomy, they're randomized between breast radiotherapy alone or breast radiotherapy plus regional nodal radiotherapy. And either no post-mastectomy radiation or comprehensive post-mastectomy radiation. And the question is, can we use this 21 gene recurrence score, this indicator of biology to essentially prognosticate for risk of local regional recurrence? And can we use it to predict the benefit of radiotherapy? I think it's a really interesting question. I don't think we should assume we know the answer to this question, but I think we should be actively accruing to trials. Now, there's another way to get an indication of biology that obviously our medical oncology colleagues are very familiar with, which is response to chemotherapy. More and more patients are getting neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And we now gain this new piece of information, which is how they respond. And so there's some cool NSABP data that's retrospective, but went back and looked at the risk of local regional recurrence 
in women who'd received neoadjuvant chemo on the basis of response. So this is looking at patients in the NSABP B18 and B27 trials. And what we see is for women who had breast conservation and who had a path CR in the breast and nose, they had a low risk of in-breast recurrence seen in this maize color and a super low risk of regional nodal irradiation seen in this blue color. For those women who, excuse me, who underwent mastectomy, I should go back here, the risk of local regional recurrence was very low. Now these are small subsets of patients and all that, but still it's, it's quite interesting. We didn't do quite as well in the group of women who had a path CR in the nodes, but not the breast. The risk of in-breast recurrence was somewhat higher and the risk of a regional nodal recurrence was somewhat higher, although still much better than the population that retained disease in the breast and nodes. So it's suggestive that response to chemotherapy may itself be both prognostic for recurrence, and maybe will be predictive for radiotherapy benefit. And we can see that response to chemotherapy was an important indicator of local regional recurrence risk in addition to the clinical variables of clinical T stage and clinical end stage. So knowing both the clinical stage before chemo as well as the pathologic stage after chemo were both important contributors to understanding the risk of local regional recurrence. And here are some other data out of the MD Anderson that seem to show a very similar phenomenon, which is to say that clinical stage and pathologic stage, in addition to some other variables of ER negativity and high grade, were indicators of local regional recurrence. And that for those women who had a very low score and using this combination of clinical and pathologic stage, um, we didn't seem to see a large benefit for radiotherapy after mastectomy versus for women with a high score, we seem to see a much larger benefit. So again, suggesting that pre-chemo clinical stage, but also response to chemotherapy may be telling us about the benefit of radiotherapy. And so we're addressing this in a large prospective randomized trial called NSABPB51 that we had been actively accruing to. And so this is taking women who had node positive disease clinically, biopsy proven, had a complete response in the nodes to chemotherapy, and then randomizing them, radiotherapy to the breast alone or breast and lymph nodes, or similarly, if they got mastectomy, with or without post-mastectomy radiotherapy. Finally, I wanna introduce a really novel but interesting potential biomarker, and that is disseminated tumor cells. And if one works at the same institution as Dr. Crystal Finelli, we get to be excited about circulating tumor cells. And these are some French data that prospectively followed a cohort of 620 patients with non-metastatic breast cancer. They all got radiotherapy to the breast and received regional nodal radiation for certain risk factors in a non-randomized but pre-specified way. And then we looked at disseminating tumor cell status in those patients and disseminated tumor cell status was prognostic for local regional recurrence. Those women who had positive disseminated tumor cells were at higher risk for local regional recurrence. But it was also predictive. Regional nodal irradiation appeared beneficial only in that subset of patients who had positive disseminated tumor cells. So maybe this circulating tumor cell, maybe this liquid biopsy is suggestive of a, a regional nodal basin burden of disease in some way. And maybe it's an indicator of the subset of patients who would benefit from regional nodal irradiation. Again, only one series and requires validation, but I think it's pretty intriguing. All right, once we've decided about the patients we're going to treat, how long does it take to treat them? Should we be using our conventional fractionation, small doses each day for lots of days? Or should we be using larger doses for fewer days? When we look at women where we're treating the breast alone, we've really made a lot of progress in moving towards shorter regimens, fewer days. But we don't have the same level of validation when we're treating the regional nodal basins. And we have some reason to be concerned about structures like the brachial plexus. So what data do we have? And we have some non-randomized data led by Atif Khan with very short follow-up. We have one randomized trial, and that is a Chinese trial that looked at 800 women who underwent mastectomy and post-mastectomy radiotherapy. 
And we're randomized to what I'll call the American approach of um, 25 days of small doses, two gray per day times 25 days versus a hypofractionated approach that they were using in China, 2.9 gray per day times 15 days. And there's very short follow-up, a bit under five years, but it looks like the local regional recurrence rates were equivalent, acute toxicities and late toxicities were similar. So I think we need to see more patients and more validation, but this is quite intriguing that we may be able to take five weeks of treatment and shorten it to three. And in fact, we're actively looking at this question, at least in the post-mastectomy setting, but this will certainly be translated to the intact breast setting if this proves safe. And so there's a large American trial that's using what I'll call the American approach of two grade times 25 to what I call the Canadian approach because it was first validated in the Canadian trial, so 16 fractions. And this is for women with post-mastectomy irradiation. And we're looking at how this, um, our endpoints are recurrence-free survival, so an oncologic endpoint, but also about toxicity. How did the reconstruction fare? And how did we do in lymphedema and brachial plexopathy? And we are uh, actively accruing to this trial. In fact, Northwestern was, I'll have to look again, um, leading the pack with regard to accrual to this trial nationally. Um, and so we hope to really continue to contribute to it. And in a few years, hope to see this trial complete. So, when we're treating, we need to really think about toxicities. And some of these we've alluded to earlier, and I wanna really get into what are the toxicities that might be affected by regional nodal irradiation? And what are the active steps we are taking and can take to mitigate uh, these potential toxicities? And so let's first look at cardiac toxicity. And this is what we talk about the most. We think about irradiating the breast, especially the left breast, especially the internal mammary chain. We worry about heart dose. Are we right to worry? Sure. Let's look at the Swedish series that we can talk about a lot. It looked at 2000 women treated over a half century with breast radiotherapy, very roughly estimated what their heart dose was, but it had great data on their cardiac outcomes over this half century. And what we could see was more dose to the heart was worse. The, as we look at increasing mean dose to the heart, very roughly measured, we saw that the additional risk of any major coronary event, which meant MI, need for revascularization or cardiac death, so any major coronary event, rose in a linear fashion. Radiotherapy to the heart was bad and more dose was worse. And we have similar data coming out of a big meta-analysis of over 40,000 women treated in 75 trials that roughly estimated heart dose and then looked at cardiac mortality and again found that excess cardiac mortality increased linearly um, with cardiac dose. More dose to the heart was bad. When we drill down a little bit, what's going on to the heart? So here's some old data out of Duke that just looked very roughly, it did a perfusion scan before radiotherapy and a perfusion scan again a year later. And it looked very roughly at, hey, how much of the left ventricle was in the radiation field? And did that correlate with the appearance of new perfusion deficits here to the distal left ventricle and regional wall motion abnormalities right here? And the answer was, yeah. The more of the left ventricle that was in the field, in the radiation field, the more likely we were to see the appearance of perfusion deficits um, and regional wall motion abnormalities. That's not surprising. If we hit a good piece of the heart, we may injure it. If we don't hit the heart, we're a lot less likely to injure it. So let's drill down a little bigger because it looks like actually the organ at risk, if we look at the kind of substructures of the heart, it most biggest is, um, is, or are, I should say, the coronary arteries. And so there's some really cool series out of Sweden in which they were able to look at both the dose distribution, where the dose went, as well as linking that to a registry of coronary angiography and looking at the coronary arteries and especially seeing if the stenosis correlated to where the radiation went. Was it where we hit the heart, where we seem to cause coronary artery stenosis? And not surprisingly, that answer was yes. 
if we look at left breast irradiation, what we see is that's the mid and distal left anterior descending artery, our friend right here, that seem to get hit in the radiation field. And then we can correspond that to coronary angiography. And what we find is, right, because here's the distal um, and distal diagonal branches of the LAD. And it is exactly in the distal and distal diagonal branches of the LAD where there was an increase in the risk of coronary stenosis that corresponded exactly to where the radiotherapy dose went. The coronary arteries we didn't hit were at no increased risk. The coronary arteries we did hit had an increased risk, and that is not surprising. More interestingly, maybe is, is there a dose threshold? Do low doses affect the coronary arteries, only high doses? Because if we know the dose threshold, we could be sure to stay below it. And so some recent and very intriguing data by a different Swedish group corresponded the dose to um, coronary artery angiography results. And here's what we saw, that if we kept the dose, in this case to the mid LED, to one to five gray, there was no effect on the likelihood of stenosis or requiring an intervention. If we kept the dose between five and 20 gray, there was no measurable effect. But when the dose to that uh, artery exceeded 20 gray, there was a jump in the risk of uh, coronary artery stenosis and requiring angiography and uh, intervention. Well, this is really important because it gives us a sense of where we need to keep our heart doses in order to avoid this uh, outcome. Well, how could we control that dose? Well, I'll just present some pretty simple techniques. Deep inspiration breath hold. In this upper figure, we see a patient. This is an axial slice. Here we see her left breast. These clips are marking the lumpectomy bed. So there we go. And here we see her heart. And we can see with this kind of hypothetical tangent field by that red line that we can get awfully close or hit the heart with our typical field. Here is exactly the same patient at exactly the same slice as indicated by her clips, except now she is taking and holding a big deep breath. And you can see how the heart has moved inferior and posterior. It has moved really far away from the field. And if we look at this same field in what we call the beam's eye view, so we're looking along the path of the beam right here, here we can see this is the breast, this is the lumpectomy bed, and we can see her heart peeking into the radiation field. And again, the exact same patient in the beam's eye view when she has taken her big deep breath and now the heart is out of the field. And what we'll often do now is add a little cardiac block, block and make sure we're at least a centimeter or more away from the edge of the heart to the edge of the radiotherapy field. And we have really good data from a whole series of, of uh, investigations that just doing deep breath hold cuts our heart dose by at least half and the addition of a cardiac block and we're often cutting our heart dose by more like 90%, just to say an order of magnitude lower than it used to be. Does that translate, does lowering that dose translate into protecting the heart clinically. Well, here's a series out of University of Michigan where they replicated these perfusion scan studies. They did a perfusion scan before radiation and a year after radiation, but this time they used deep inspiration breath hold to entirely exclude the heart. And what did we see? Now there were absolutely no differences in perfusion defects or an in injection fraction. Missing the heart prevented the problems that we used to see at a year out. Do we have other ways of doing this? Well, we can look at the use of protons and where you know, the, the Northwestern system is the only system in Illinois with uh, the access to protons. And so that's pretty cool. And protons have this um, benefit potentially, they have this different dosimetric property, which is to say that as a photon moves into tissue, it slowly deposits its dose. But as a proton moves into tissue, it has a pretty good entrance dose, but it then after it gets to the target can stop more quickly and it has a lower exit dose. And so there are some investigations in potentially using protons in the treatment of breast cancer. And here we can see in these images, it looks pretty. We can see this dose distribution cloud stopping in the chest wall before it gets to the heart. 
It is interesting, we have relatively few published series looking at this, so our clinical data are pretty early. If you look across all published series, it's still probably under 100 patients who um, have, whose outcomes have been published using protons and regional nodal irradiation. But it does look dosimetrically like it can achieve quite a low dose and like it achieves um, apparently outcomes um, with regard to local region recurrence and pneumonitis rates that look pretty comparable to photons. We do see a brisk skin reaction with protons, but it recovers um, pretty well, perhaps not quite as well as photons, but pretty well. And so we now have a randomized trial. Our West region has accrued nicely to this, and we now have it open as well. That's randomizing, excuse me, that's randomizing women who require regional nodal radiation between photons and protons. And you know, even if this trial doesn't find a benefit for the whole subset, it also is gonna look carefully at doses to different cardiac structures and then looking at their cardiac outcomes. And so even if we don't find a benefit for the whole subset, it may give us an indication of what doses to what cardiac substructures seem to be associated with um, adverse cardiac outcomes. So where does this leave us? Well, I really like actually the recommendations of a German panel that I think, why did I go to a German panel? Because it, I think, gives the clearest recommendations of any um, body so far that says, hey, we really should use deep inspiration breath hold. It's clear that protons have some dosimetric advantage. On the margin, they incrementally reduce heart dose above and beyond what we can achieve with photons and deep breath hold. It's not clear what its clinical impact should be. So we should definitely use deep breath hold and we should consider protons in patients with a long life expectancy where we can't meet tight cardiac constraints with a photon approach. And so I wanna go on for just a minute to think about another potential side effect, which is um, upper extremity lymphedema, breast cancer related lymphedema. And this is, just a devastating side effect when we see it. And, you know, we really see, you know, it's, we have studies that show, but it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see this is a problem functionally. It's a problem with a person's sense of self and appearance. It can be a problem health-wise. It's a big deal and it's devastating for women. And so what are the key drivers of lymphedema risk? Well, here's a series out of the Mass General, but it's really representative of all our series, which is, Increasing BMI, increasing axillary surgery, so in this case, an axillary dissection as compared to a sentinel node biopsy, and the receipt of regional nodal irradiation all appear to be key drivers for lymphedema risk. Cellulitis is associated too, although it's unclear the directionality. Does cellulitis cause lymphedema or does lymphedema cause cellulitis or is it a little bit of both? And so, are there ways to use regional nodal irradiation but limit its effect on lymphedema? And here I'll highlight some research that came out of our Northwestern group. Um, we went to the investigators of the MA20 trial and got their whole data set and looked at the inclusion of the dissected axilla when doing regional nodal irradiation. And what did we see with lymphedema risk? Well, what we saw was we recapitulated the finding that increasing BMI was associated with increasing risk. Not surprising. We recapitulated the finding that increasing uh, extent of regional nodal surgery increased the risk. The more lymph nodes that came out, the greater the risk of lymphedema. Not surprising. But we also saw, excuse me, that radiation field design was a key driver. That when we excluded the dissected axilla, we in fact saw a much lower rate of lymphedema that when we, than when we included the dissected axilla. And this um, may be one way in which we seem to be able to oncologic, in an oncologically safe way derive the benefit of regional nodal irradiation by treating only the undissected apex and supraclavicular fossa and excluding the dissected axilla, we may get the benefit of regional nodal irradiation without nearly as much risk of lymphedema. And here pictured below is just a, an appearance of a nomogram that was derived from this training set. It was validated internally by um, a subset, validated using bootstrap methods, validated on an external subset. So it does look like this is a nicely validated a nomogram to use to identify women who are at higher risk of lymphedema um, on the basis of their BMI, 
the type of regional nodal irradiation there, or the type of radiotherapy they're receiving, the extent of their axillary surgery. And when we identify a high-risk subgroup, some group, we can then know a group for whom we can look at early intervention. Uh, and when we looked at this in the subsequent follow-up study in a three-dimensional fashion, it really did look like in, it was radiotherapy that went here to the starred area, which is essentially corresponding to where the arm lymphatics seem to mostly traverse through. And in this region that was dissected, it was radiotherapy dose here that seemed to be strongly associated with lymphedema risk. And so we're now studying here at Northwestern or about to open, cleared through the SRC in a, in a prospective trial. Um, our plastic surgeon, um, Dr. Jordan is doing what we call uh, a lympho procedure or a lymphovenous bypass, identifying a severed lymphatic, connecting it to a low pressure venule to bypass where, these, where the lymphatic was severed, where its obstruction would be, placing radio opaque clips, and then seeing if we are able to exclude that region from the radiotherapy field. So in other words, can we make this uh, bypass and can we hopefully avoid it with radiotherapy to probably preserve the integrity of this lymphatic venule anastomosis. And we can target these interventions for those patients who are at higher risk for developing lymphedema. Um, and I'll end by looking, not in detail, but just mentioning the use of regional nodal radiation is actually quite complex. And so this is just um, one slide, and I'll walk through this very briefly, of the NM systems consensus guidelines. So when a patient is receiving radiotherapy um, across the NM system, these represent what our guidelines look like for women with intact breast cancer receiving regional nodal irradiation. And it's more complex than you may think because we're thinking about how to get women onto trials that look at when we should omit radiotherapy on the basis of biologic subtype, when we should omit radiotherapy on the basis of um, response to chemotherapy, when we can shorten radiotherapy um, into uh, hypofractionated regimens, when we might want to consider a proton trial. And, um, in addition to that, we have defined very clear and quantitative dose volume constraints on the heart and on cardiac substructures that are related to the data you saw before. If we know what the safe limits of dose are, then we can assure that we keep our patients below those limits. And across our system, we now believe that the way we should be using our proton facility off study is using it for those patients where we cannot achieve very safe dose volume constraints using photons and deep inspiration breath hold. And so I'm gonna pause now and open the floor to questions. I hope I haven't confused you a little too much, but I wanted to give you just a little taste of the ways in which we're evaluating the roles of regional nodal irradiation, how we might use it in the future, how we might make it safer, cheaper, and faster than ever before. Thanks so much for your attention. Thank you very much for that fantastic talk, uh, Dr. Strauss. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat box at this juncture. Um, I do have a couple if uh, there anybody else. I, needs I, have, a, I have a question, John, uh, Jonathan, for Jonathan. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You know, if you could just expand a little bit, obviously we, we encountered these patients who are attracted to the idea of proton therapy and you indicated that there may be some indication off study, but it's pretty narrow. You, you described the patients who can't do the deep, deep ins. What do these patients look like? I mean, who, who are they? Are they the, the, the uh, way skinny people that can't take a deep breath or are they the obese patients can, that can't do that? I mean, what do these patients look like? Well, the first thing I'll say is I think the vast majority of patients can do voluntary deep breath hold. So I actually think, and, and if they, and truthfully, a patient who can't hold their breath for 20 seconds does not have a, a life expectancy 
that exceeds 10 years as a general rule. Instead, what I would say is there are people- I just, I just took a stopwatch out. Yeah, <laughs> um, uh, I will say this. It, it is instead, I think, people with anatomy that just isn't um, amenable to making a good plan. And there are some people whose heart is just kind of plastered up against the chest wall and doesn't move very much at a deep breath hold. And maybe you've made as good a plan as you can make and still aren't meeting your constraints. Those are the patients who I think our current consensus is should maybe, maybe we should be making a comparative proton plan. And, and I think, of course, just enrolling anybody in a randomized trial, protons versus photons, is, is a valuable technique. But I would say the number of patients who are, you know, in good health with the, the reasonable life expectancy and who cannot get dose constraints met using high quality photons is actually, that subset's actually pretty small. But sometimes I think it's just really reassuring to patients to say, hey, if we can't get a great proton plan, that's when we're going to do photon. Or excuse me, if we can't get a great photon plan, that's when we're going to do protons. Um, and so, but we don't have to do it for everybody. We can, you know, make that assessment. I, I think that's probably a wiser approach than not trying to make a photon plan and just starting at protons for everybody. Um, I wanted to ask also sort of a follow-up question for the patients who have more medial tumors, they could be axillary node negative, but you have this concern because of the medial location. The internal mammary nodes, either one, how do you assess them? And two, would you, even in the setting of an axillary node um, negative by sentinel node, would you consider, what would the, the circumstances where you radiate the internal mammary nodes? That is an excellent question. Um, and I will say two things to it. The first is that we can occasionally detect enlarged IM nodes on either MRI or PET or staging CT, but more commonly breast MRI. So for a patient with a medial tumor and a suspicious or likely involved IM node radiographically, I'd encompass the internal mammary chain. But outside of that, I have not been routinely encompassing the internal mammary nodes for patients with axillary node negative disease and no radiographic evidence of involvement, even if it's a medial tumor. And one can argue, hey, those were, you know, almost half of the patients on the EORTC trial and they were 10% of the people in ME20. And that's true. But I will say, at least on meta-analysis, that the axillary node negative patients seem to derive a, an awfully small, almost vanishingly small benefit from from regional nodal irradiation and I just haven't been sold on it. And, and maybe we'll have some other way of, of finding a subset of those patients we should be treating, but for now, I'm just not, in, I'm just not treating them. Great, thanks. That's a great talk. Thank you. Um, Jonathan, it's Regina, I have a question. Sure. So the cumulative incidence for radiation and heart damage, I'm assuming increases as time goes by. So. Should women, because this is, I think, the number one uh, issue that patients raise when they say we don't want to do radiation because we're afraid of the risk to the heart. So what can we say to them in terms of reassurance, aside from the techniques? Is this something that is a five-year, a 10-year? When do they need to stop worrying in terms of the cardiac risk? And were any studies done that looked at coronary CTs to assess you know, five years, 10 years later, do interventions need to be done for these women? So we have a series of data sources, because you ask a great question. This is a really big source of concern for our patients. We have a series of data sources that are helpful here. One is we can look at, and I didn't include these data, but they, they come out of both SEER and, and some big Scandinavian series and a big German analysis. When we look at women treated by decade, with breast radiation. And then we look at laterality and we use laterality as a surrogate for heart dose. We compare left-sided versus right-sided. If we go back a few decades, and we look at women treated in like the seventies or eighties, what we see, and then we follow them for decades. What we see is that there is a higher risk of cardiac mortality if you got left-sided breast radiation as compared to right. As we get closer to the modern era, that entire effect disappears. And you now see absolutely no difference between women treated on the left versus right, which again, that laterality is kind of a surrogate for dose. And some of those, you know, 
we don't have super long follow-up. We may only have one decade of follow-up for women who were treated, you know, in the most modern era, but it really looks like the, on a population basis, that effect is disappearing. And I will say, I think that's disappearing because our techniques have gotten better in radiotherapy, but I also think it's disappearing because our cardiovascular people are just better than they used to be. And the result is that like, there are just fewer cardiac events or that they don't translate, even if they have a cardiac event, doesn't translate to cardiac deaths. We have that. And then you are also right to say that if we look in the olden days, when we hit the heart, that risk never disappeared. So in other words, like 30 years later, I think they, people who had a significant heart dose were still at elevated risk as compared to their um, non-irradiated cohort from the same year. Um, so I do think that women treated a long time ago who got a lot of heart dose, they never need, they never have a point where they can stop worrying because they always are at higher risk. Um, but at the same time, it looks like in modern cohorts, all of this effect is disappearing. Um, and that even precedes some of our really good techniques. Um, so I tend to think that honestly, heart dose is an issue that we have really solved, at least for places doing active cardiac sparing. And I will say too, you know, when we started a deep breath hold program almost a decade ago, a bunch of years ago now, yeah. um, there was only us in UFC, now tons of hospitals are doing it. So it, I really think there's, most patients are in pretty good stead now. So Jonathan, or Dr. Strauss, you'd mentioned um, that the use of proton therapy could potentially um, minimize toxicity to surrounding normal tissues by virtue of how that dose is delivered and the fact that it kind of delivers its um, sort of electromagnetic payload, so to speak, to the tumor site in question. Um, and pardon me, this is coming from somebody who it's been years since I practiced solid tumor uh, medicine. So yeah. uh, coming from a hematologic spectrum, I, I don't have uh, much experience by way of radiation oncology uh, medicine, but is there, you'd also mentioned that proton uh, beams are, are are not very available. I think there's only one center. It's our center in, in, under Northwestern Medicine in the state of Illinois. So what do you think is the reason for the lack of adoption of this uh, you know, therapeutic modality? Because it's been around for several years. Is it still a cost? Is there a, a, a bit of a reticence in people to embrace it? Or is it a combination of both? I think there are a few points to consider. The first is, look, this is a modality where if you look at all the published series we have, like in breast cancer, which is really common, uh, you've got fewer than a hundred women. You know what I mean? It, it, this, is, this is not well studied and the series that we have have very short follow-up. Um, that's number one. Uh, number two is if we look across organ sites, so if we look at our fellows, you know, other organ sites where we have had small photon versus proton trials emerge, it is fair to say it hasn't, it hasn't shown us the benefit we might have hoped for, right? We've got a couple of little ones in lung. We've got one in esophagus. All our pneumonitis rates are the same. All our survival rates are the same. Our individual toxicities are mostly the same. It, it hasn't, so far, we've got a bunch of trials pending. So far, it, it hasn't shown us the benefit I think a lot of us were hoping for. But the major key is, it's actually, it is a really complicated particle to use. It has certain downsides and it's really expensive. And I think most of us believe there is absolutely gonna be a role for protons. There is and will be a role for protons in medicine. But defining that role clearly is I think vital in, in part because it, it is really expensive. Um, and if it's not giving us an incremental benefit over good photon techniques, we, we should restrict it to where it is. Thank you for that. Sure. Uh, all right, well, I don't wanna keep people longer than necessary. I'm, I'm grateful to, to the audience for staying through all this and for, and for uh, the group for the invitation. John, I have one 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 oh, sure. last question. I'm sorry Could, yeah. for the broader audience. Can you just make a comment on what we now uh, generally view as optimal uh, radiation therapy for the breast? The shorter uh, duration versus longer, just just for oh yeah assumptions. 
so, you know, I was really, this talk was really about um, uh, treating node positive breast cancer, but let's jump to node negative breast cancer for a minute where we have much better trial data. Um, when I was in training, you know, everybody got about five and a half weeks to the whole breast. Everyone got a boost. We were at about six and a half weeks. And that's obviously a hassle for patients. And it's really expensive because um, time on the Linux expensive. And uh, a series of trials came out of Canada and Great Britain that showed us that we could treat the breast in three weeks and then plus or minus a boost, which would make it four. And so we really switched everybody to three to four weeks. And we now have some early data, but some cool data out of Great Britain looking at a one week approach. And maybe it gives a touch more breast fibrosis. So maybe, and that probably evolves over time. So maybe I'm not gonna do that for a 30 year old, but, but we are using that a lot in women who are undergoing breast conservation, either partial breast radiation or older women undergoing breast conservation, where we've now moved from our three to four week approach to more like a one week approach. And this is making a big deal, both because, I mean, it's cheaper, it's way more convenient, and it actually has less acute skin reaction. So we're seeing women getting through this, barely even getting a sunburn um, and being done in a week. And I'm glad you asked the question because you know I like to brag about radiotherapy and I would say, name another specialty where our treatments are getting safer, more effective, faster, more convenient and cheaper. Um, it's pretty cool. And you know maybe adoption of some of these hypofractionated techniques is lagging a bit behind where it should be, but we are seeing it really get, um, we're, we're seeing it move into more common practice. Thank you. Well, thank you very, very much, Dr. Strauss, for a very informative um, and, and you know, enriching talk. Really appreciate your time, and I think it was a good way to close out the academic Grand Rounds lecture series for the for the academic year. So, thank you. Have a great day and a nice weekend. Thanks so much, and you as well.